Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today's live event. My name is Chi Johnson and I am a marketing specialist at Intellum. Our team of award-winning customer educational customer education professionals help the largest and fastest moving brands in the world successfully educate their customers, partners, and employees. We are the innovators, the doers, the educators, and for over 22 years, we have been observing and rethinking how people learn and collaborate. Customer education is a practical solution to a lot of issues organizations face with retention, revenue, and achieving crucial business outcomes. It can often feel pretty complicated, but Intellum is here to help. This webinar series underscore is our way of providing more insight into what customer education is and can be. We prop up our experts to share their knowledge and practical advice right here inside the Intellum platform. Today, we are presenting the power of video in customer education. Despite being educational in nature, videos are vastly underutilized in customer education. And so we're going to detail how and why videos, both live, on demand, short form, long form, and everything in between, how, why and how they should be a prioritized component of your education program. So it is now my pleasure to introduce one of our featured speakers. Um, first up, we have Tamara Jones, aka TJ. Uh, she is an eight-year veteran of the Intellum platform, and after wearing a few different hats over the years, she has settled into her role as a product manager, driving development and ideas of the learning platform. TJ hails from Atlanta, Georgia, where she enjoys taking her dogs, Gypsy and Salem, out to the dog park and tending to her many, many houseplants. If you manage to find her on Instagram, she posts them and they are <laughs> glorious. Um, but in her free time, TJ likes to solve word puzzles and build Lego with her fiance. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We're, let's set the, the stage here and talk about videos, 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 videos. We're in a video right now. I'm sure you guys understand and have been using videos very often for the past two years. Um, so I think we should start by just defining what types of video can be utilized within a customer education program. So Tamara, let's start right there. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so I like to bucketize videos into three categories. You have live events, you have on-demand video, and then you have sessions. So as she was just saying, live events, that's like a webinar that we're on right now. It's live, um, something like Facebook Live, YouTube Live, go live content. Um, then you have your on-demand videos. Uh, those can be previous live webinars that you've had before. You're just converting them to on-demand so learners can come back and either review or maybe engage if they weren't able to meet your schedule, right? So you record it and then you upload it to your learning platform and they have access to it. That's sort of on demand. That's one portion of on demand. A second section of on demand is also your short and long form form video content. So if you have a short video that you're trying to educate learners on a particular part of your app, um, they can engage with it that way. Or maybe a longer video that's really part of a certification program. So that is your on demand video. And then you also have sessions, right? So sessions can be any sort of curriculum based content. So it's you know, it can be live. Um, you have people joining sessions like within the learning platform and they sort of navigate through that curriculum experience. I really like those definitions. It makes it very clear. I like that we've got the buckets. So you can understand like the different types and how they manifest within an education program. Um, but I want to specifically talk about um, in 2020, uh, specifically like at the onset of the pandemic, we saw like an astronomical demand for live event capabilities, right? Um, everyone was scrambling to try to figure out how to educate their audiences. Uh, and we personally uh, had a whole like product shift. So can we talk about the thinking behind hosting um, like live events specifically inside of a customer education program or platform um, versus, uh, sorry, hosting them inside of a customer education platform versus hosting them in your traditional virtual event platform. Because yeah, you're on the front lines of that initiative. So yes. you've got all the tea. <laughs> yeah, there's a huge value add. And a particular customer that we had, um, I mean, they had people using their product all over the globe. And when the pandemic hit, you know, they saw this, uh, this market, right? That market, they were teachers. They needed to figure out how to educate their students remotely. And it's like, yeah, we can all use the platform. We can all go through the bells and whistles. We know what we're doing. But when you're, you know, when you're producing a curriculum and you're really trying to engage students, 
um, this particular customer, they really want to figure out, um, you know, how can we engage these teachers, help them out, help them with this transition? What can we teach them? So maybe their core audience wasn't necessarily teachers, right? I mean, they their platform is available to everybody, but they created a series, a live event series that was geared towards educators and they brought them on. Um, it was a success. We saw engagement like on a social aspect. Um, they were, you know, they left the webinars that have like breakout sessions. They would talk about things. Um, and the result was, is that, you know, these teachers came in and they learned something new through this webinar series, but then they could also go and like touch other content, right? They could say, all right, yeah, that was like a, you know, a dope like webinar. What else is here? What else can I learn? What other on-demand content can I engage with? And that's the value of having a live event that's outside of structured content, right? It's like you can bring somebody in who wouldn't normally be there and they can learn new things and pick up new content. That's a really, really great takeaway, especially if you are already delivering customer education and you are exploring the idea of presenting live events in that way. Like you said, it, it, it you're already in the learning environment. Like that's the that's the benefit. So right. after a year of this, you know, uh, so now we're fast forwarding to last year, 2021, um, from a provider side, like on from your lens. What was the biggest takeaway? So we we know we had a big pivot and started offering virtual events and started offering that option to not just our customers, but to new customers as well. What was our biggest takeaway from an Intel inside? I mean, there's a thirst for premium virtual capabilities. And again, that's whether you're delivering it live as we're doing now, um, whether it's going to be on demand. So somebody can go pick and choose what they're learning at any given time or a structured structured session that's in a curriculum based format. Um, you know, even though we're sort of moving towards this new um, this new world of in person, right? It feels kind of weird. We're like <laughs> you go to the grocery store, you're like, who are all these people? Um, as we move forward with that, we also have to think about how do we reach a broader audience, right? So, you know, even if you are having a, a live event, maybe you're like, hey, we can actually go run our, you know, our live event, you know, where we like to host it. We can be on stage. We can have an audience in person. That's fantastic. Um, I have a weird, I have a little hobby. It's called it's a planner hobby. And in the planner community, we have a huge conference called Go Wild. And everybody flocks to it. Thousands of people come to talk about planners and organization because like that's my shtick. Um, but in instances like that, it's important that you can continue to reach a global audience. So folks can make it there. Let's say 10,000 people make it. Think about how many people can make it if you have an online engagement aspect of it. How people can log in and engage with that conference, engage with that customer education. And you not just have them looped into that particular series, but they're going to go explore content elsewhere. They're going to go figure out what are things that I don't know about this product? What do they have to offer? That's huge. I love that. I, the, I think that is a huge takeaway, like just from the shift to, to from live to virtual and then back to live. It, it's, we're, we're not ever going back to just live. I think most right. companies have seen the benefit of offering some sort of hybrid environment, right? Because if you only host the live event and only offer your you're offering to people in front of you, you almost are, you're isolating some of your customer base. So I think the benefit, like you mentioned, is for example, for your uh, planner conference, like they can reach so many more people by offering that hybrid opportunity and offering um, that, that live aspect, the virtual aspect to the live event. Um, so now that we talked about live events and virtual webinars and things that, in that aspect, underscore here is a live event that we host once a month very regularly, but we also make it available on demand, which is why I pressed the record button in the beginning. <laughs> so let's talk about on-demand videos. Uh, you know, we deliver ours three days later, so on Monday, two business days if we count that. Um, but what is the value of this in reference to an education program? Can we talk through that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So with on-demand content, so maybe we just sort of pull back a little bit and we're talking about what we're, you know, this webinar right now and how we're going to post it and it's going to be readily available. That's the value right there, right? So, I mean, with uh, hosting live things um, virtually, you still have people that can't meet your schedule, but they still want to engage with your content. So that way you can convert your live webinars to on-demand videos, 
they're a bit more long form. It's still your structured webinar live and that's happening. Um, so there's value in that as well. And then of course you have your long and your short form video content. So outside of having standalone webinars, I mean, you still need structured content. We're still trying to teach people something valuable in different ways. Um, so you can have maybe a two minute video that's teaching a particular aspect of, you know, an app or a product, or you can have a longer form video that's geared towards mastery, right? Maybe you have a, a soft knowledge check or a full on certification thereafter. Um, there is value in video because I think as we have gone through this experience of not being able to connect with people the way that we have before, that video content is super helpful. Seeing a face and a, and a person speak and talk to you is incredibly paramount. Um, I have been, you know, uh, in my graduate studies during an entire pandemic, and I saw like the shift of educators. They were just like, they were, they were scrambling. They were trying to figure it out. And about, you know, you know, months in to a year in, they're like, all right, we figured this out. And you start to see the quality in the video content rise and it really being valuable to your education. Because I'm not going to lie, it was definitely uh, my anecdotal um, <laughs> hard point trying to see a professor trying to shift from, you know, their typical way of instructing to an online environment. And there was just something about like those just the video content that they provided when it was a person speaking and providing value and speaking to the points and the curriculum that you could follow and then read up thereafter. So I, I want people to really take away from this and understand that um, in a learning environment, you know, even though it's a video, even if it's pre-produced, there's still value in seeing a human face explain content to you. I think that is really, really, really great like anecdote. And I know that Katie's going to come in and bring us some research that actually supports your experience and why there is um, like there's actual real learning science behind why you retain the information better. Um, and we actually have a question in the Q&A um, that, that I think would be more appropriate to answer once we get through some of um, the research. So um, but before we move before we move on to the next type of video content, um, video type, we do have a question from Savannah. She said, do you think there is a value in multiple forms of short on-demand videos, i.e. YouTube and utilizing other social media platforms? Ooh, so you know what? Let's put a pin in that one because I think that's a great question for our Q&A after we see some research too. So great questions coming in, keep them coming in. Um, so before we dive into the science though, I will see what learning science has to say about all of this. Um, my last question to you, Tamara, is I want to dive into standard sessions and talk through how video can be used there. I know for me, you you mentioned earlier um, that this is typically when you have more of like a predefined curriculum. This is not your one-off events that you're recording and then offering on demand, even though those on-demand videos can be a part of curriculum later. Like mm -hmm. personally, we onboarded a new tool, um, a new platform um, within our team, and there's a set implementation, right? There's set things that I need to learn in order to master, to, um, I need to learn in order to master the product and fully integrate it into my workflow, right? To get what we're paying for. And the entire time they, they're setting up meetings after meetings, after meetings, sending spreadsheets after spreadsheets and emails and things like that. And the whole time, all I kept saying was, if you could just record a video <laughs> and send it to me, or if I could just have like a course that I could log into and learn how to do what you're telling me to do, like, this would be so much better. So can you dive into why, like what that is and give me, give me your spiel on standard sessions. That's just yeah. my anecdote. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in certain formats, like you said, like you were trying to uh, gain knowledge on a, on a new piece of software. And sometimes, you know, short or long form videos are better for that, right. Where you can stop, pause and replay. I think when we talk about um, sessions and a structured, structured curriculum, it's more about, all right, you know, like I said, onboarding cohorts, um, any sort of like structured activity. Maybe you even have um, assessments that need to be proctored. You can use sessions for that. My, I like to lean towards using those structured sessions for like, there's, there's a huge end goal here. There's a huge learning initiative. And, you know, we have remote workforces now. We have obviously remote users that can't always come and learn something in person. That's a good place for your sessions to exist.
sorry, I started moving my windows and I lost my mute button. <laughs> um, yes, I love that. And so like the, my biggest takeaway from that is I, ultimately it took me months, much longer than necessary in order to integrate the tool. And so I love that idea, like that you can, you, like not the idea, the, the reality that you can really use these standard sessions in order to deliver knowledge in a real, a real and meaningful way. Um, so now... I want to get into some science, 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 science. So if you're not familiar with how we do things here at Intellum, um, we have our methodology. We have this really awesome, awesome way that we go about uh, administering customer education or education as a whole to any audience that you're trying to deliver it to. And if you want to learn more about that, lots of resources on our blog. You can watch last month's webinar. Um, but what's really important, a lot of people don't realize on the surface is that learning science is at the core of our product, our platform, and everything that we do. And it's a, a whole entire department within our company. And we have this really, really great community called Learning Science Weekly. And so that is where we deliver a lot of education research. And so I'll get into how you can get that. Um, but before I do, I want to introduce our next speaker. So um, I am it's with great, great, great pleasure that I get to introduce this person. She's a, a, a powerhouse. She's a genius. But Katie has been with Intellum for almost a year now, uh, coming up in June, actually. She has been, uh, she has a PhD in psychology from UF and, you know, go Gators. Even though Sorry, I, don't I, have I put it in. I was like, I'm going to have her say it. <laughs> I would say go Gators for her just because she asked so nicely. <laughs> Um, but she was an assistant prof professor, 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 prior to discovering her desire to bring research into industry. But she continues to teach as well. Dr. Katie is a new mama to a five-month-old Angus and spends her days trying to get her dogs to stop licking the kid's face. So, uh, she and her wife enjoy taking their little one to the zoo and exploring Atlanta parks, which are stunning and gorgeous. So if you've never been here, we have tons of green space. We truly are the city in a forest. So, and so without further ado, Dr. Katie, can you tell us, you know, video has been around for a really long time, but the way we engage with it now, it's only been around for a few years. For a few years. So can you tell us what science has to say about the power of video in customer education? I hope so. Um, <laughs> no, I think we talk about this all the time. Like, uh, oh, I have to cut things so short because I can go on and on forever, right? Like, this is my whole job. Um, thank you for the congrats on the baby, by the way. He is, he is a joy when he's not actively teething like this morning. Um, <laughs> he's just screaming. We have lots of frozen things ready to go. Um, but yeah, so I am going to pull up my slides and be exactly what TJ hates from an instructor, which is taking a second to deal with technical issues. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, okay. So essentially, I think I did. I'm not going to lie. Okay. So I was a grad student and a university instructor when the pandemic started. And so I had both sides. I understand. I get it. It was a joy. <laughs> Um, but I'll go ahead and start while, while we're getting it pulled up so that we're not killing too much, <laughs> too much time. No worries. Uh, so my goal is essentially to talk about, right, how to make a successful video for learning. And there's so much involved in this. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of going to break it down in just a few different facets of videos that can make them productive for learning. Um, and so the way that I broke it down, you can see here, is I'm actually going to talk about a few topics. And as we go through these topics, um, I'll kind of put in what applies to the different types of videos, right? Okay, moving on. We're, so we're going to go through all of these. I assume that, that you can read these, these four bullets. So we're starting with narrative. Um, and I call it the triple tell them, which is not something I made up um, at all. I'm not, I'm not that smart or witty, um, but other people are, alas. And like I said, this isn't really what we call it in research, but nonetheless, the point still stands. It's that quote that you probably heard in like elementary school or middle school when you started to write papers and they were like, tell them what you're going to tell them and then tell them and then tell them what you've told them, you know, um, which... Tellum is great because there are so many pun opportunities within Tellum, but like, I think that's because I'm a new that parent. The, that's the first thing that came to my mind, <laughs> and especially with our company name, Intellum, but I'll, we could go on and on. <laughs> I know. I'll save you the, the dad joke humor. Um, 
But regardless, research supports this, right? Research shows that you want to prep learners for what they're about to learn um, because it really helps them to think about what they're going to learn, to prepare, to organize that information, how they're literally just going to like plop it in their brain, right? Um, and so we want to be able to frame our, our lesson or our course or anything like that without being too repetitive, of course, right? So in the last slide, I showed you like these four things we're going to talk about, um, but we don't want to keep like narrative, narrative, na like nobody wants to hear that you're going to tune me out if I do that, right? So quick intro to the topic so we, we know what we're going to chat about, right? And then our next step, oh, I didn't even have to say it. Look at this duo um, <laughs> is segmenting. So we've told them what we're going to tell them, right? We started our intro. How do we actually tell them these things? Um, so one of the biggest things that we want to employ is called segmenting, um, which you might have heard of if you're familiar with Richard Mayer. It also goes hand in hand with something called blocked practice, if you're familiar with that. But essentially, the idea here is that we want to break up information into what progressively presented parts, right? And we want them to be fairly small parts. Um, so research shows that learners are going to consistently perform better with information presented in smaller chunks. So this was actually, this isn't obviously from the study, this image, I made it myself. Um, but <laughs> essentially, right, learners are going to perform much better with four videos that are five minute chunks rather than watching this 20 minute video, right? This is like from a study, multiple studies. We've seen this quite a few times. So how do we chunk it, right? It can be five different short videos placed next to each other. It can be a long video that has these predetermined segments where it stops and learners have to click like a next button to continue. Um, the opportunities are really endless. I think that's a, one of the fun parts of like being an instructional designer is figuring out how you want to employ this segmenting technique. Just be sure to follow segmenting or blocked pr practice. So when we get to the segment, right, when we get to that stop point, what are we going to do there? And this is something TJ said before, which are knowledge checks. Knowledge checks are super beneficial and segmenting creates that opportunity so nicely, right? We're stopping our video. We can use these knowledge checks. We can use these quick little points where we're checking in on our learners, right? Ask a question about the segment that they just went over. Make sure they're understanding the material. And research really supports this. So it shows that putting questions throughout videos improves memory and self-assessment. And self-assessment, I could go into forever because it's super important. We don't have the time. But if you're interested in why it's important to learning, um, I just recommend you look up metacognition. Check out Learning Science Weekly for more. Um, yeah, so we can do this during a live session, right? Like, I could pause you here and be like, hey, how are you doing? Again, we're not doing that right now. But if this was a session where I needed that, I would do it. Um, or we could have a quick chat. Reflections are also incredibly helpful. So reflections are something that are a little bit more in depth than a knowledge check. We're, we're employing more abstract critical thinking skills here. So we're instead of this, like what we see here would be considered like a knowledge check um, where we're asking, you know, this multiple choice question about some information we provided above. Um, with a reflection, we're asking more like, what's your reasoning? What brought you to this conclusion? Um, so it's a little bit different. We're, we're using this critical reflection skills, and that would probably be more useful in a standard session. Um, but that's not to negate its usefulness in an on-demand video or a pre-recorded session either. Even just asking learners to think about it themselves without talking about it, um, we see it leads to like really great learning outcomes. So it could be used in all types of videos. I encourage you to use it in all types of videos. Um, a quick caveat to this that I wanted to point out is, is streaming. So when we're streaming something, um, we don't want learner questions popping up, right, on a screen. I think you're watching a video and these, these comments are just flooding over the video. We don't, we don't want that if we're trying that to, to teach somebody something, right? That might be helpful for, like, if you're watching a video of a dog pressing buttons, which... We can get into the learning behind that all day, but this is a marital problem in my household. Um, the dogs pressing buttons and knowing language. Regardless, 
you probably, that's fine, have comments. But if you're trying to use it for some sort of instruction, we don't want comments flooding uh, over the video because that actually decreases learning. Um, and we'll chat about interactions later. They're super important. The next thing that we want to talk about are viewer controls. And this is something that TJ also brought up earlier, which is the ability to like play and pause and rewind, right? Um, and so this is something that we want to do. We want to be able to give learners the remote, so to speak. Um, it allows them to adjust the video for how difficult the information is for them, right? If you and I are watching a video on neuroscience, it's going to be different, right? It might be less difficult for me because I have graduate education in neuroscience. If you're a dentist and we're watching a video on teeth, like I'm going to need to watch it a little longer than you. I don't know anything about that. So we want to give them the remote. We want them to be able to adjust for concepts that they're not familiar with. And it helps because they can essentially segment the video for themselves, right? But you should do it for them. Don't trust them to segment it themselves. The next thing that we uh, would like to include so that viewers can control things are an interactive table of contents, if possible. Um, this is fairly new work, so I don't, I don't think a whole lot of people are familiar with the learning outcomes from this. Um, but for pre-recorded videos, an interactive table of contents actually promotes learner organization and it boosts recall. So we see that it really helps learning. Um, learners might not know to use it. Again, this is like fairly new, like she said, right? Like the amount that we're using videos these days is like way more than before. So just encourage them to use it because um, they're probably not going to do it spontaneously. Next. Okay, our next one is a little bit trickier. Um, so for subtitles and captions, I wanna start by saying absolutely, subtitles are helpful for accessibility. They're absolutely necessary for accessibility. I do not want to like trample on that at all. We need to have subtitles and captions for accessibility. The problem is that they do provide quite a bit of cognitive load, which means there's a lot more to process, right? If you are seeing something on a screen and hearing it, um, this is called the redundancy effect. And so should we have them? They should be available, but it might be helpful to have them turned off or to remind people to turn them off uh, if they don't need the subtitles because it, it it's a lot harder on our brain to process it. Okay. Multimedia. So this is um, talking about what we have on our screen. Oh, I did not see your questions. The YouTube spreadsheet. Yes. That was just talking about the um, table of contents. So it was, it was just a spreadsheet to put in a table of contents for a YouTube video. Um, so if you have a uh, a video, you can click a link, right, within the video. Um, sometimes it's in the description, sometimes it's on the video itself, and you can jump to a specific segment of the video. So it's a way of segmenting the video uh, online. Does that make sense a little bit more? Cool, yeah, yeah. Yeah, perfect, okay. Um, sorry, I know I'm going through it fast. So if you have questions, definitely, send them at me. Uh, okay, so for multimedia, this is talking about what we're putting on our screen and our videos. Um, and essentially, we want to use signaling. It's a visual cue that's going to point out a key topic. Again, made this myself. Very. They should hire me as a graphic designer, I think. That's pretty fancy. <laughs> I did not measure them at all. They're probably at very different dif distances. Um, <laughs> but we want to use some sort of visual cue to tell learners, like, what's important here. We want to point out our key topics or our concepts in some fashion, right? Highlight, change in colors, use a graphic underlining. So, like, for the other day, um, it was International Women's Day, right? And I have my son, Angus, is five months old, and we had him in a little shirt uh, that... Uh, said the future is female and I posted a picture of him and you got to take the circle and put it on the shirt otherwise they're just like oh a cute baby and I'm like no a small feminist baby right you have to point them to the right place <laughs> 
So we just want to make sure to highlight something. We want to have that, that visual cue that says like, hey, pay attention to this. Next. Thank you. Thank you for the name compliment. He gets a lot of, uh, he gets a lot of beef references. A lot of his aunts just call him beef, but it's cool. It's fun. We like it. <laughs> um, so for spatial uh, contiguity, this is again, talking about how we're going to organize information on the screen. Um, so if we have this image and we want to draw attention to it, if we have a text and an image, right? Essentially, this says we just want them close together. Um, we want to present the material at the same time in close proximity. So for this, right, this top image is going to show us this is example of following this spatial contiguity principle, right? The image is next to the brain. It's labeling the parts. But the bottom one isn't. And that's going to be much more complex for learners to follow. Next. What's interesting before yeah. I, uh, I advance on is the, if you're curious about the accessibility implications of this, um, you can watch a previous, I'm always going to plug previous underscores, but we did a previous underscore about accessibility and um, Tim Bland actually talked through how important it is um, for the visual part of it for, for people who might have a visual impairment or an ability. This actually makes it easier to read when you have the text much closer to the image or you have the the combination of signaling as well with the arrows and things, it makes it much easier for the brain to process and for people who have impairments to understand and to process it and retain it as well. So yeah, yeah, especially for that. linguistic uh, impairments as well. Yeah, yeah. I don't have much to say here. I just wanted to make sure to plug this because people always want to put like a music in their videos or like have these really cool backgrounds. And like this GIF is distracting in and of itself, which is why I used it. Um, so imagine if I'm standing here and in the background, I have like this weird stuff moving. It's distracting. It's too much for our brains to process. The cognitive load is, is way too much um, and it, it brings down learning. So just don't put complex backgrounds. Don't use music if, we're, if our goal is learning, right? Again, if you have a fun TikTok, go for it, but otherwise. <laughs> Can TJ ask a quick question about using multimedia? Do you feel like it's not as distracting if the media that you're using is in relation to the content? Like maybe you have like a chart or something that's explanatory to the concepts that you're including in your sort of right hand, uh, you know, typed out information. Yeah. Yeah. If it's, if it's relevant to the information we're presenting, then yes, it, it's helpful. Right. Um, if it's something that's just pretty, it's not super helpful. It's called a seductive detail, uh, in the okay. literature. Yeah. Yeah. So like, even in my notes, I, I wrote somewhere like, you probably won't even remember this slide. Cause that's, that's like a cute joke. Um, which I, I skipped, but you brought us back, TJ, you brought us back. <laughs> you managed to bring it in. So I'm here for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. If it's relevant, then for sure. It can be very helpful. Um, okay. Our, is this our last one? I think, oh no, we have interactions. Instructor characteristics. Um, so who's on the screen? Who's in the video, right? Um, diversity is something we definitely want to include. So there's good research on this. When people have social models, um, it can really boost self-efficacy and it boosts learner engagement. So to keep that engagement and self-efficacy up, we want to have um, instructors or pedagogical agents, whoever is on the screen, we want to vary them by race, gender, et cetera, um, so that we make sure we're being representative and inclusive. And it boosts, again, boosts learning. So real win-win all around. Um, we want to have a live person if possible. Uh, so what TJ was talking about, right? That's going to help us with that social interaction. And we have a lot of social motivation as people. Um, so when we have a static image of an instructor on the screen, it's actually distracting. So if you don't have a person like in front of you and moving, don't really include that. Just a picture is not going to be helpful. It's actually going to bring your learning down. But when we have a real human, it improves learning transfer, it improves satisfaction with the course. So we want to try to stick to a live person. Obviously, as a live human, you gesture 
ideally, probably not always. If you're like a really static person, good for you. I am not because I was raised by a very like flamboyant mother. Um, so I'm all over the place and a gesturing instructor can improve learning. So we want to try to incorporate those gestures. Um, if we can, there's a little bit of a difference here with types of gestures. So if information is visually complex, pointing gestures are helpful, right? If you're doing like math, you can point to a part of the equation. Um, but if it's just kind of like this, what I have here, beat gestures or depictive gestures are good. Beat gestures are just like these moving hands while talking. Depictive gestures are illustrating a concept. So like big and small. Um, yes. Yeah, so what about an animated person or emoji, something like that? Yeah. So that would be like a pedagogical agent, which I didn't include here because we, oh, it's huge and we don't have time for it. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of cool research on it, right? I, you guys are all kind of coming in with uh, very similar things. Digital animated instructors, pedagogical agents. Yeah. Um, humans are generally going to be best, but pedagogical agents are super helpful and can improve learning for sure. Um, again, I encourage you to check out Learning Science Weekly or shoot me an email. We can chat about it because it's a lot to get into. But the findings here are very similar. Gesturing, very lifelike for pedagogical agents are going to be best for learning as well. Okay. So for personalization, this is, again, kind of continuing that, um, and I think answers one of the questions in the chat as well. Um, using a conversational tone actually leads to much better learning. So we don't want to do this kind of like high and mighty academic thing. It's not going to help. Having a conversational tone is actually what, what we see boosts learning using you rather than the learner or I rather than the instructor, right? That's going to help learning a lot. Uh, and I think this is also relevant to the pedagogical agent question, was, which is voice. So we want to use an appealing human voice, even if we have a pedagogical agent. Um, I know this like internet trend of having Google read our text is a thing, but like that's not good for learning. Again, super fun for videos online, not great for learning. We want to make sure to have a human, a human voice in our videos. I love that you keep mentioning that because I think it's really important as um, organizations are putting together customer education programs and employee education programs and education programs as a whole. I think it's really trendy to try to adopt what's trending because there is that social implication yeah. on how people consume their content and how that affects learning. But I've, I really like that you are mentioning how like, yes, these things work well in social. Yes, these things have their place. But the, when we're trying to focus on learning, they may not be the best use of your resources, of your time, and a best way to execute your content. So thank you for, for mentioning that. And I, these are some great questions. And I think we're going to use that. We're going to dive into those more once um, uh, Katie finishes her science. I know. I promise we only have like one more thing left. Um, the only thing with affect is that, you know, research shows a positive affect, a positive mood helps, uh, promote learning. It leads to higher motivation for learners. Enthusiasm also increases motivation and that social partnership. So <laughs> interactions. Um, yeah. So we're like this social species, right? How do we, how do we use that social interaction drive to motivate us? And how do we integrate that into customer ed through videos? Um, and so TJ talks about live streams, which I really wanted to touch on. Um, and I think somebody asked about emojis earlier as well. Um, so something that's interesting with live streams is there are these emojis, right? That you can click and the person presenting sees them. They're a huge part of interaction. And my like educated guess would be that they would be helpful overall for the instructor or whoever's on the live stream, the presenter as feedback. But I haven't seen any research on this. So I want to be like super clear about that. There's no research on it that I've seen. If you've seen it, send it to me because I would love to read it. Um, so that area needs more work. But what we do know about live streams is that when you engage in knowledge sharing over live, live streams, uh, learners understand the content and it really helps them with learning afterwards as well. Um, so for discussions, 
I told you we get back to this interaction part. Um, how do we do this? So we've talked about knowledge checks, which fit very well into discussions. We can go into reflections. Um, you can integrate discussions at that point after a knowledge check. But discussions are also super helpful for on-demand videos. So um, one thing here is that we want to integrate structured discussions. Um, research really shows that having this structured discussion leads to improvements in learning, but spontaneous discussions actually don't. So we just want to make sure to have a place, right? This post-session place to go to. It can be on your LMS. For us at Intellum, it might be on Tribe or it might be on Community, something like that, where we can go after the event and talk about it. And maybe there's a prompt, right? So that it's that structured place. We did it. This is my closing slide, just as a recap for our video types. So one, overarchingly, one thing I want us to take from this is that online courses are just as effective as face-to-face -face courses. There's a lot of research coming out about this. Obviously, we want to do it in a way that makes it effective. For instructional sessions, um, standard sessions do lead to improved learning over on demand or pre recorded. So, if we have the option to do a live session, we should opt for that. If we don't, that's okay. Um, we can just do things to make our pre recorded or on demand videos more effective. And then the last one is one we just chatted about live streams do aid in learning. Um, I just that's something I don't see around. I don't think a lot of people are aware of that live streams are actually helpful for learning. We did it, team. We went through the science. Yay. That was you awesome. You did great. I was, I was taking awesome. note. I was like, she's going to teach me something. <laughs> Listen, we I'm actually, a product manager. <laughs> <laughs> we had the slides and we had the, the information. And if you were a subscriber to Learning Science Weekly, you actually got those, uh, a, a lot yeah. of that information already this morning um, as a special issue. Um, but even then, it was just really great. So I want to dive into some questions. I know we had some planned discussion, but we've got some really great questions and I want to make sure that we get to them. The one thing before we dive into q a is we did want to discuss some considerations for creating video. It's something that we often overlook when we're trying to integrate a new content type into our workflows and into our education programs. It's just how much it takes to do it. This is something we're learning as a marketing team within uh, Intellum and that most people will see, tend to overlook. So some of the considerations um, that we wanted to talk about, and I'll just, I'll breeze through these really quickly so we can dive into Q&A since we are within like 15 minutes of the end of our session is that what resources do you have available to actually produce, edit, and deliver your video? So we're talking about people. So who are your SMEs? Who are the people who are gonna be featured and actually gonna deliver this information? Um, what's your budget? Video can be very, very inexpensive to produce, i.e opening a Zoom, pressing record, and then you have the recording, they will give you a text file, audio file, video files, um, but you also have to consider the quality of the camera that's on, that's being, that's, that's your pedagogical agent, possibly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I just like wanted to say that word um, is using to record. So how high quality is the camera that they're using? Those are things you have to consider. Um, do you need to send equipment? Do you need uh, to have external microphones and things like that? Um, the actual time it's going to take to record, um, the actual time it's going to take to produce. Does your team even have the bandwidth to carve out moments of their day to record the videos or to deliver a live event? Those are all really important things to consider. Um, additionally, what does post-production look like? Um, who is going to edit these videos? Who's going to make sure that the audio is clean? Do you have software that will allow you to do that? These are things that most people don't think about, like, oh, let's just record a video, pop open my camera phone, and then I can have it done there. But you might have to make an investment into producing this video as well. So you might want to consider those. Um, additionally, uh, when we're talking about delivering videos within an education program, it's really important that you're considering the strategy, the content strategy, your education strategy, the overall point of your program. Is video actually the right type of content to deliver that education, to deliver the knowledge you need your learner to retain? That's something that you can um, that you should figure out. Um, we Our next month's webinar will help you do that. Um, but that's really important that you're uh, considering how you're architecting your content in order to get the outcome you're looking for within your program. And then the last most important thing we wanted to talk about was analysis. So do you have time baked into your timeline to actually evaluate what's working and what isn't? 
So uh, are you taking the time to look at when drop-off happens on your on-demand videos? Are you taking the time to look at revisits and replays? Um, could there be an opportunity for a knowledge check if you're getting the same replay at the same moment from multiple users? That means maybe that it's not as clear as it could be. Maybe it's a good moment to enter in a knowledge check so that you can help sustain and as Katie showed in her research, actually drive home the, the concept you're trying to deliver. So I know I breezed through those, but I wanted to get to these questions. Do you guys have anything to add to those, those bullets? <laughs> I would add um, interactivity within videos. Mm. Um, as a product manager, you know, we've been wanting to revamp how we serve up video. And when I was interviewing clients, you know, typically I will have a structured set of questions and I'll just, you know, if I need to change something in the product, I'll have a structured set of questions. This go round, I said, you know, just blank slate. What is your video wish list? How do you wish to deliver video content? And I think that's because we enter, if we interact with video players on a consistent basis, like with Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and they can all be drastically different depending on the length of video that they are delivering. And a consistent message that I received when I did those interviews was interactivity. Um, and interactivity can be anything. I think as, you know, as we were mentioning, I think that's also being in the chat. And as Katie was talking about, whether it's, you know, somebody sending heart emojis on a video or somebody engaging in chat functionality or somebody engaging with the breakout group, interactivity can mean different things. Um, but what I think is important about interactivity is like, look at that engagement. Is the engagement, you know, somebody can, or people continually asking questions about the content, meaning that it didn't resonate? Or is it an extension of the conversation around the, around the content to where that's like, all right, we get it. We have more to talk about. Let's start solidifying that and thinking about how it applies to us. That is what I think is important about engagement. It's a great call out. It's a really great call out. Katie, anything to add? No, no. I think I took up a lot of our time. So I'm, <laughs> I'll, I'll step back. And so let's, let's get into some of these questions. I think the first one we had from an anonymous attendee was um, saying that we, when we mentioned the benefit of hosting webinars and learning platforms, as opposed to traditional platforms, um, that the opportunity is that customers get to explore other learning content. Do we have any metrics on how many other pieces of learning content viewers engaged with on average after watching um, inside of a platform? Like, I don't know if you have any specific metrics like ready handy on your dandy notebooks, but do we have just kind of um, an overarching understanding of if people actually did it and how? We know they did, it, but how? <laughs> Yeah, I feel like I don't have that in my back pocket, but it's something that I am willing to explore, especially as the, the product manager that is influencing video content right now. I want to know, like, you know, is somebody that engages in live content, how often are they going to other content? I think that's very, that's an interesting question. Um, it's something that I have seen anecdotally throughout, um, I guess, certain instances. But yeah, we'll figure out those metrics. That's a good call out. I like it. Yeah. I don't so have any more... specifics. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tree. No, you go ahead, Katie. Um, yeah, I don't have any specifics, but I know that there's a little bit of research. Um, it's a it's a study that I read a while ago. I'd have to look back at it. Um, but it talked about hosting instructional videos. It was actually for dental students on YouTube versus like their in-class platform. Um, and the students specifically wanted to have access to the videos later. Um, and so that's something that might play into that, um, a little bit is like, is this person going to have access to this video on my platform at a later date? Do you want them to? And I will say, uh, Tamar mentioned that it is anecdotal as far as, uh, the benefit to being inside the learning platform, but we did hear feedback from customers. I know from a marketing perspective, that that was a really value add because they spent so much time, so much financial investment into building these education programs and that the live events they were producing were and were the goal was to continue that education and to actually deliver education. So the benefit was that they could continue their, their entering into the learning environment in order to come to this event, but they're also seeing this other content that they've spent so much time and so much money to build and invest in. So I think that's another important call out. 
Um, our next question is, do you think there's value in multiple forms of short on-demand videos, i.e. YouTube and utilizing other social media platforms? So we talked about the benefit in chunking up videos into smaller. It's something we're starting to do with Underscore, actually, taking some of the really great nuggets and turning them into smaller videos that can we can then put out in order to see. So you don't necessarily have to watch the whole thing, but you can get some of the really great nuggets from it. So can we talk about um, the value from the research side, Katie? Um, so I don't know if there's, I personally haven't read anything about like hosting a video on multiple forms of social media or anything like that. Um, but definitely like the chunking portion, like you said, right? Segmenting the videos are going to be helpful. Um, and I think that's something that we see a lot on social media right now. Like even, you know, with the prevalence of reels and TikTok and all of that, like everyone's pretty much caught on that our, our attention span is a little bit shorter. Um, so if we have these pre-recorded videos, uh, yeah, we, we want to have them short on demand. Uh, if they're live, it's a little bit different. Okay, so we have another question. Thank you, Meredith. How would the interactive table of contents work with an LMS system that doesn't work like YouTube? So Tamara, can you talk to specifically, I wanna, I, I did not get this caveat earlier. Underscore is never meant to be, come by the Intel platform and deliver your education program through us. Now that's a great benefit. I would love if you did, but the point of this is so that no matter what platform you're using to deliver customer education, you can, um, you can take what we're teaching and apply it to your platform and your program. So Tamara, from a practicality standpoint, I do think this is a great opportunity to talk about our particular product. Um, can you talk <laughs> about that interactivity with the table of contents? Absolutely. So Katie was speaking to chunking videos, right? So if you, let's say you have a page and you have a piece of video content, let's just say it's three minutes long, and then you have some text below it, and then you have another video, you can table of contents that. Uh, what we are working on from a product perspective, which I'm really excited about, is actually bookmarking segments in your video. So you can also include that and in the contents that are, you know, happening thereafter, whatever video segment that you've just shown. So people are not only just jumping to content on the left-hand panel of maybe like a table of contents, but maybe you're speaking to something very specific in a video and you're like, hey, this is where I can find it. Um, and I think that's the, you know, the value add of having video integrated in a textual concept, uh, context along with a table of contents, right? You always want to give your learner an out. Like, again, I go back to this anecdote, like with me in grad school, and I need to know, like, I want to know the table of contents. I don't know what I'm working through, how long those videos are going to be. And I'd like to, you know, maybe I need to chunk it over a couple of days because it's, you know, it could be lengthy or, you know, I can get it done in an hour, but that outline is helpful in knowing, you know, which videos I'm going to watch, what content I need to read. And again, those, uh, those bookmarks, if I need to jump to a particular subject, let me get right there and maybe review it once, twice or thrice. So I can really retain it. I think that's great, great advice and great feedback. So the next question we have from Karen, it's really great. Um, is this scientific research from around the globe or mainly from North America? Um, their experience is that Americans are used to videos, but most prefer live training while Europeans require it um, even or won't follow e-learning if they can avoid it. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually uh, global. Um, I, I think it's difficult to to say that it's like universal across all cultures right we would have to literally run studies in every single culture for every single one of these questions and we're just not quite there yet um but the research that i include does does include various countries across being um you know american european asian um so it's it's global research um, and I haven't seen anything that's vastly different. I do have a learning science weekly issue that talks about how demographics affect learning on online platforms. So feel free to check that out. Uh, but yeah, it's a great question and it's global. So we've got some really great questions in the chat and continuing to come in on the Q&A, but we've got two minutes left. So I do want to respect everyone's time. We can deliver them in a post uh, webinar um, format. 
So uh, within the blog post, we can probably give you written advice. First action item here is to make sure you subscribe to Learning Science Weekly. It is Katie's um, weekly what do we call it? Pocket of knowledge in your inbox. You're going to get the latest cutting edge research on learning science. And it is literally a weekly thing. It also has its own .com. So if you want to uh, read past issues of learning science weekly, you can go to learningscienceweekly.com to check that out. Also, um, we would love for you to follow us on LinkedIn and tell them is an amazing customer education, uh, company, but we also are the smartest way to educate your customers, partners, and employees. And we will share uh, blog articles, lots of really great industry insights and research, and uh, just really great happenings that you can find on our page. And you can connect with our employees and our experts and ask questions directly. Uh, of course, we want you to connect with both Dr. Katie and Tamara on LinkedIn so you can find their pages. Those are their headshots and so that you can know you're finding the right, correct person. Make sure you connect with them. And if you have questions for them directly, you can send them in a DM. And then last, we would love for you to join us for next month's underscore webinar. We are delivering architecting content for customer education. Our featured speaker is Joe King, senior e-learning designer at Construct Agency. Um, he's going to be talking about exactly what it takes to deliver an education program that is meeting your business goals and how to really look at that content and what it needs to look like, how to know if video is the best thing or yeah. if it's a text space or slideshows or anything like that. And the very last thing I need you to do is give us your feedback. I read each and everything that you submit. So you can go to uh, bit.ly slash underscore feedback and submit a very short, like one and a half minute video, um, one and a half minute survey that will help me uh, make sure that we're delivering content that works best for you. Okay. So those are my slides. That's the end there. Um, I will hang on and have somebody with their hand raised. So Kelly, Read, give me just a second. I'm going to promote you so you can ask your question live. Kelly. Kelly's a, a, an LSW reader, which I love, obviously. I love when you guys show up. All right, Kelly, you can chat us up. You should be able to talk now. Sorry, I, I actually did not mean to have the raise hand button. I'm turning red here, even though you can't see me, but um, I'll just <laughs> use my unmuted moment to say thank you for a great session. <laughs> Sorry, so I'll pay attention. This is awesome. But, so even yeah. if you didn't mean to raise your hand, we're glad to have you on stage with us. Well, you had a question earlier that I noted, and I wanted to circle oh, back yeah. after the Q&A anyway. Okay. Um, so Mayer still does a, a whole lot of research. Um, and so the one that I, I referenced in my presentation is actually a book. Um, and then I referenced a couple of his newer studies. So it's both, right? He does have research that started in the 90s, and that was the foundation of it all. Um, but there's been revision to it. So uh, the book is new and like kind of updated and includes new and old research. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everybody, that's our underscore for this month. Thank you so much for joining us for the Power of Video and Customer Education. And we look forward to seeing you next month on April 14th, Joe King for Architecting Content for Customer Education. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon or morning or night, wherever you're joining us from the globe. Bye.